Uh, I like to talk a lot. <laughs> and there's been no shortage of times that um, I've run my mouth and said things that I shouldn't. I, I tend to overshare. I tend to be maybe a little too honest sometimes. And I'll say things to, to people that I probably shouldn't. You are a warrior. Are 21 status? What kind of vehicle is it? You are the very best your nation has to offer. 911. Open the bus off. They're asking you to lead. Five. We need a bear cat. It's up to us. So 133. I need somebody that's got a visual on where the shooter is. You must be sound in mind, body, and spirit. 40 feet. Where's the officer down? I have a rescue helicopter that wants to land and help. This is the podcast that will make you the one. The one that will bring everyone back. Probably we have shot fired, shot fired. Give me back up now. Because no one else is coming. I'm going to have an officer shot. An officer shot. 100 block of East Street. Suspect is down. Suspect is down. This is The Squad Room. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Squad Room Podcast, where we learn how to serve, strive, and succeed in our challenging career. My name is Garrett Teslaw, and I'm an active duty sergeant for a sheriff's office in Southern California, and I'm on a mission to build a world where first responders wake up inspired, feel confident at work, and go home safe knowing they've spent their time in a worthy cause. Before we get to our guest for today, I want to remind you of a few things. First, if you're on social media, make sure you're following us at the Squad Room on Instagram and that you've liked our Facebook page. Also, make sure you join our Facebook group. Just search The Squad Room Group to join. But most importantly is that you head over to thesquadroom.net and get signed up for our mailing list. People on that list get exclusive access to some free resource downloads, and I also send out content there that's exclusive to that list. So don't miss out on something that can help you in your life or in your career. So join our list at thesquadroom.net. Now, my guest today is Mike Doyle. Mike is a co-host of the uh, very popular podcast and the very well-done podcast, uh, Tactical Tangents, where he covers uh, issues in policing, but also in the military. And he and his co-host go deep, deep into the weeds on policy issues and deconstructing use of force and just conversations about timely topics in law enforcement and in the first responder communities and in the military. And I really enjoy the show. We talk about how Mike and I first, quote unquote, met uh, uh, at least through social media. And we talk a lot about um, lessons we've learned in our careers, how uh, to develop some self-awareness, how to uh, review and understand what people think of you at work, why that's important to consider those things and not just blow them off, uh, how we have gone about uh, asking for assistance from people, maybe sometimes where our own hubris and our own uh, uh, arrogance, if it were, or our own assumptions of our own greatness have gotten in the way of our careers. So it's a great talk from two guys who have roughly about the same amount of time on. Uh, he goes through his background here. So uh, please check them out, Tactical Tangents Podcast. And here we are with uh, Mike Doyle. This episode is sponsored by Signature Coins. For months now, I've been looking for a way to say thank you to my guests and supporters. And after being involved in a major international incident recently, I was given quite a few challenge coins. And I was surprised at how much each of those meant to me. So I decided to make a squad room challenge coin to share with guests and supporters. I went searching for a company who could meet my high standards, but I was still nervous about making a purchase like this online. Most challenge coins you order these days are ordered online, produced in a factory far, far away, and tracking down someone in customer service can be, well, a challenge. And I'll admit that I'm kind of old school, and I prefer to look someone in the eye when I'm about to spend that much money. So I delayed on a decision on a vendor for a long time until I found Signature Coins out of Florida. Turns out some of the guys at Signature Coins actually listened to the show. And when I contacted them, we connected immediately on our shared purpose of honoring this profession that I love so much. Daniel, Trey, Jeff, and all the other guys at Signature immediately put me at ease with making such a big purchase. And they bent over backwards to make sure that the coin I wanted that was in my head came out as a reality that I'm now holding in my hand. Now, if you're like me and you haven't drawn anything since it involved a crayon, have no fear. Signature Coins has 30 graphic artists on staff right in their Orlando office to help, and they don't charge a single penny to get your artwork ready for production. That is a big difference from other companies that often charge an artwork fee, or maybe you have to hire an outside designer. Signature Coins does all the art for free with no obligation to buy. 
They also have inclusive pricing, meaning that you're not going to get hit with a hidden upcharge at checkout. A 100% guarantee on their craftsmanship and free next day shipping in the U.S. And their customer service team is right there in Orlando. Their turnaround is quick, about two weeks, which is super fast for coins. And like I said, free next day shipping when your coins are ready to go out the door. I couldn't be happier with my coins, and I couldn't be happier that I got them from Signature Coins. If you're looking to make a challenge coin of your own, you can find out more about them at SignatureCoins.com or email info at SignatureCoins.com, and Jeff will hook you up with a quote. If you use the coupon code the Squad Room, you'll get $50 off your first order. Learn more at SignatureCoins.com. Mike Doyle of the Tactical Tangents Podcast. Welcome uh, to the Squad Room, Mike. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to have you here. Fun story about how you actually ended up on the show. Uh, you're a member of our Facebook group and uh, uh, for the squad room. And um, uh, I forget what question I asked, but I asked a question and you responded and you made some sort of sly comment or or like vague comment about having a podcast or a show of your own. And uh, so I had to do <laughs> a little digging. was not a shameless and, plug. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, it was not a shameless plug. You were not out there uh, <laughs> pimping anything. <laughs> um, but just, you know, you, yeah, you mentioned like, oh, I have the show. And then it turns out that I listened to your show and like your show. And I didn't you know, obviously connect the dots that, uh, cause you only use your first name on the show, um, that, you know, you're the same guy. So, uh, was excited because I was like, oh, here's another, Hey, I love having other podcasters on, uh, because, you know, podcasters don't have any fear of talking, <laughs> um, and, and, and. <laughs> I, I dare I say not not rambling, but you know we'll talk, and uh, it's not hard to pull <laughs> answers out of another podcaster or someone who's got that background. So, uh, but yeah, so welcome yeah, to the my, show. My Tactical friends will tangents. tell you that I have no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to mine, cut you off. No, no, yeah, mine as well. That guy, like, oh, you want to hear someone talk for thirty minutes? Like, that's, that's fire up Garrett, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I, I wanted to, um, I want to have you on because. Not only are you a very good podcaster, uh, but a, a rather successful police officer too. And I guess that's I'm I'm defining success in that sense. I guess from the outside in, looking at your your history, uh, but it seems like you've had to this point a, a rather good career. Uh, and I was going to say fun, but I don't know if fun's the right word. Uh, maybe it is. Oh, it's but, fun. <laughs> <laughs> but but tell people a little bit real quick just a little bit about like the kind of department you work at and and your your history and the jobs you've had in the job so i've been with the department i work for for 12 years and i i started as a, I, I actually worked in ems prior to this i worked on an ambulance as an emt in california for a while and i came to arizona to be a cop and kind of brought that experience with me going to 911 calls and doing the the medical thing. And it w I've always been a big fan of teaching. So I, I got into the field training stuff pretty early on. I, I taught a number of topics out at the academy and went and did scenarios and, and those sorts of things. And then eventually got onto the SWAT team here. I work as one of our tactical medics now. And I also got into the canine unit. Uh, that was one of those early kind of goals that I had to, uh, an opportunity to go on a, on a canine search for a bad guy one time. And, and it was like the coolest thing ever when we found the dude. So I'm like, that's what I'm doing. So, uh, now I work in, in the canine unit as a, uh, dual purpose dog handler. I have a patrol and narcotics detection dog. And those, those two assignments, SWAT and canine kind of, they're, they're different assignments, but they complement each other pretty well. And so that's what I'm up to. That's what I do. That and a, a lot of teaching. That does sound like a lot of fun, actually, you know, canine, was one of the spots how many dogs do you, does your department have uh we have nine patrol dogs we used to have 10 the the sergeant used to be a, a handler position and it's not anymore so we're down to nine handlers and a sergeant and that's for the patrol dogs we also have we've got a couple uh narcotics single purpose dogs that work in our uh you know with our narcotics detectives mm -hmm. we've got a couple bomb dogs that work in our eod unit but they're they're helped, you know, we help train and, and certify those dogs, but they're not officially a part of the canine unit. So pretty, okay. So, but a sizable amount of dogs for, for your agency and, you, and your agency is big, uh, uh, you know, and it may not necessarily be big by a lot of, a lot of people stay. It's funny, you know, 
Okay, speaking of tangents, I'm about to go off on one. So it's <laughs> it's funny to me. Like it's funny to me about like uh don't laugh, about size. Um uh, in the sense that like I work for a, a department that most would consider massive, you know, because the like there's eight hundred and fifty thousand cops out there in, in just the US, you know, and we and just like your show, we have listeners in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, England, and you know, all over the English speaking world. I'm huge in Slovenia. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, my, my department, I think of as small in comparison to a department like yours, which to me is very large, but then there's even larger than yours, of course, like, and I'm not even talking like NYPD, but like, you know, your, your department's very, is big. You got about, about 800 officers, I think, um, that, that have made it through all the budget cuts. And, uh, yeah. So there's, I don't, there's no real point to it, but other than like, you know, if it, you describe your agency as like mid-sized, but to me, like, I think I'm mid-sized. <laughs> I, you know, we have about 500 sworn between the custody side and the law side. Um, and uh, that's, to me, small. But I talk to other people who like run a department of 10 people, right? And they can't wrap their head around the idea of having a 500 sworn. And I like, I work uh, a <laughs> lot with LA County, uh, work a lot with those guys, especially their SWAT and SEB guys who are just awesome human beings. And, you know, they're, lo they're looking at like 9,000 sworn. And I can't wrap my head around how big that is. <laughs> so it's all perspective, I guess. Uh, it, yeah, it is. It is relative. There's an obligatory like that's what she said in there somewhere. Um, but <laughs> yes, yeah, the, yeah, the size thing is <laughs> it is relative to agency to agency, because depending on where you work, you know, there's probably people listening to the show that represent agencies throughout the spectrum of whatever we consider to be large and small. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you look at an agency like Chicago or New York or. Um, LA that's ha that has tens of thousands of cops. And then there's these small town agencies that might have, you know, you can count on both hands, the, the entire department. And mm -hmm. it's one of the interesting things about policing when we talk about, you know, especially, you know, policing in the 2020s is a, is a challenging thing. And a lot of people are, are demanding a lot more out of our, our law enforcement kind of culture, if you will, or, you know, profession in, as an institution, but each agency has to tackle those problems differently. If you're a 10 person or, or even a 50 or hundred person department, the problems that you face have to be handled differently than an agency that has 30,000 cops. I mean, how do you hold in-service training for 30,000 people and maintain quality? That's, I mean, in and of itself, that's just a nightmare, right? So yeah, it's, it's fascinating to to look at that issue, you know, just the, the different size of agencies and the problems that we face. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of, it's like an essential part of the problem of policing right now is the, is you have that. That's a great example that you used of, of training 30,000 cops, but then you have the flip side of that. And it's, how do you bring quality training to your 10 cops? And, you know, the chances of working in a, a department where there's you know, less than 10, certainly, but like 10, 30, 40 officers, the chance that you have a full-time training officer is, is pretty rare. And, ha and, so, but, but to just meet the demands of your state post, that's a full-time job for anyone to kind of keep up on. Right. So how does a small department bring quality training to their officers too, and keep up that, that quality and, and thoroughness. And, you know, I'm lucky that I work in an area where I work urban areas and, uh, suburban and I've worked uh, ranches and vineyard areas and very rural areas. So a wide variety. And I've worked in areas where, you know, you can throw 20 cops at a problem uh, if it's bad. Uh, and I've worked in areas where yeah. your backup's 20 minutes away. And mm -hmm. I never believed until I did both that there was a difference in the kind of policing you have to do. But it is very different. Oh, it's huge. Uh, it's huge. Yeah. 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 And how you approach things. Um, is, is very dynamic, but, but what I think is often a challenge for us, us as a, as a, as a profession is, you know, on that 911 call, regardless of the size of the agency, when an officer gets dispatched, whether in, whether they're in Chicago or they're in, 
North Platte, Nebraska, right? The the <laughs> obligation. That a place you actually know, or did you just make that up? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's an actual. I know there's a North Platte, and I think it's in Nebraska because I used to drive through Nebraska to go visit family from from Denver to like Iowa, but <laughs> the actual place. Um, but my point is, like, when that officer gets the call, whether they're Chicago or they're or North Platte that officer still has to respond and have the same knowledge, skills, and abilities regardless of the environment they're in, right? They can't just rely on the fact they got 30,000 people behind them or that they've only got nine. It has to be on that individual officer. That's such a dynamic in policing that I think that people miss. Like, yeah, well, and, yeah, and, and this is something I think about a lot because you talked about being like the training officer for an agency that only has a handful of people. And what what base of experience does that guy have? I mean, he's maybe he's seen it all and done it all for what they, for what they get, but they might not get the volume of stuff that those guys get in the larger agencies, but then those larger agency guys, they've never gotten to see, you know, the, the way to manage a problem when you're by yourself or you only have got three or four guys when, like you said, you otherwise would have 20 people to pr throw at a problem. So yeah, it's, it is a it's a dynamic that I think is underappreciated when we talk about the challenges that that law enforcement faces. Yeah, and then yeah, it's just it's you know it's uh, I'm 16 years in. I just passed uh, 16 years uh, total, and the profession still fascinates me. You know, like just what we have to do on a regular basis and what's kind of incumbent on each individual officer and whether you work a rural area where your backup's 20 minutes away or you're working a place where there's, you know, shootings on the, on the hour. <laughs> and, uh, and then to consider, as I've spoken about in the past, like the spectrum of, of that's required of police officers and the kind of people that police work brings in, whether it's someone who has more of a, a coaching and, um, mentoring kind of attitude and you know goes the FTO road route or the training route or the school resource officer kind of route or the more tactically minded cops that are out there that are SWAT and special response teams or the the community resource officers like all of those things are encompassed inside of the job of policing yet they all require different skill sets different mindset different talents uh and it I wish we could find a way to convince the public or show the public that this is a complicated job that we we maybe we haven't figured it out yet, but it it's far more complicated than calling nine one one and having some schlub show up at your door to handle a problem. You know, I don't know <laughs> how, how do we solve that in the next hour, Mike? <laughs> All right, so you grew up in Southern California, and I, I'm not going to expect you to answer that because that's an impossible question to answer. It's just something that I wrap I try to wrap my head around all the time. You know, yeah. Um, so you grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Uh, and you left Southern California. You, I mean, you have a history in the medical field uh, running a, an ambulance rig, but uh, eventually moved out to Arizona, uh, where it's, um, at the time we talk, it's one of the only areas of the country that's not under a deep freeze. Uh, and <laughs> what was it about, you know, back then in, in 2008 when you started or as you started applying what were the things you were looking for in a department and what is it that brought you to Arizona? Well, California was an expensive place to live. And at, at the time I had I'll to just to update you, it still is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, right? The the um working at a private ambulance company as an EMT doing doing that gig, I mean, I had to work a minimum amount of overtime to pay to pay my rent. And so that, that kind of got old, and the route out of that was to do, like, the, the firefighter paramedic thing, which I wasn't really feeling at the time. I was looking for, for something. I, I had a different itch to scratch, I guess, and so uh, law enforcement was one of those things. I started – I was actually in backgrounds with a department back home that was on a hiring freeze because, the obviously, 2007, 2008 was a economic disaster, and a lot of agencies were feeling that, so – one of the other things I, I spent a little bit of time in the Air Force. Um, I enlisted and was active duty for six or seven months, and I ended up getting kicked out on a medical. And it's it's kind of a, a long and, and boring story, but I was trying to fight that and go back in. And so I had a couple of options. I can go six hours north to San Jose, or I can come six hours east into uh, Arizona. And so that's that's what I did. I, I checked out both places, and I liked 
Tucson for what it was and cost of living was a lot more affordable. It, it solved a lot of problems for me, I guess. And so uh, in the meantime, I saw that a department here was hiring and put my name in the hat and I ended up having enough fun with this job that I just stayed doing this and uh, stuck with law enforcement. It was awesome. No, that's great. Um, you know, growing up in Southern California, there's a, there's a certain ideal out there, I think, or maybe, and it, maybe it's just a misconception completely, but, um, what do you, as, as someone in Southern California myself, what do you miss about California? Um, or is there nothing <laughs> except family? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously family, um, you know, it's close enough to be accessible, but far enough to still be kind of a pain to drive out there. Um, <laughs> I, I, I miss real mountains and, and that's, I, that's coming from someone that understands that even California mountains aren't that real compared to a lot of places in the, in the country, in the world. But compared to what I have here in Southern Arizona, the mountains in California, I do kind of miss, um, the weather is better sometimes. I mean, the it's a dry heat thing does carry some weight certain times a year, but we also get like the thunderstorms out here and stuff in the summer that bring the humidity with it. So, um, I honestly, not a whole lot. I mean, I, I'm pretty happy with where I ended up. Uh, California is cool. I, there's a lot of things that I, that I do like about California, but nothing that I couldn't satisfy being here, to be honest with you. A lot of people oh, always nice. talk about the beach. Um, mm -hmm. People always say like, oh, yeah, but the beach, you know what? I was too busy working when I lived in California to be able to go enjoy the beach very much. So um, I've gotten to more ha hang out on nice beaches, more working here than I have there. So I don't know. Not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer, really. I mean, yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, you talk about the beach thing, and it's absolutely true. I moved to an area where I have, I counted once, I think it's like seven beaches, all great within like, 20 minutes of my house. Right. And it wasn't until the pandemic struck and everything else closed down and we're like, what do we do? Uh, that we started going <laughs> to the beach regularly and like utilizing it. And my wife and I realized like we were probably going to the beach like maybe once a year, once, maybe twice. Um, and our kids yeah. weren't like in the water or anything like that. And it was just funny. It's like, we, I literally live, I can smell the ocean from my house <laughs> and you don't take advantage of those things because you get so locked into the work and the routine and working overtime to, you know, pay that rent. Uh, and I think a lot of people can, yeah. you know, and, and it doesn't have to be that. My point is, is that it doesn't have to be a beach that you're missing out on. It could be a mountain bike ride or it could be uh, going shooting or going to the, you know, going hunting or those things that we do throughout our lives that, uh, that we enjoy that kind of help us off gas the stress of the job. Kevin Gil Martin talks about this a lot about the Eustas. You know, I used to mountain bike, I used to golf, I used to go hunting, I used to go to the beach. And, you know, it's something that happened to me. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time. I just thought I wasn't into that thing anymore. And like, oh, I'm on to other hobbies like podcasting. But uh, like I'm staring at my mountain bike as we talk because I'm in the garage today and what that how how much more that bike has sat in the last 10 years than it's been ridden and it's a, it's a, my point in this is for people who are listening who are on the especially on the younger side but the guys who are in and men and women who are you know 15 20 years in we got to retain some of those things that we do outside the job to help us de-stress. Otherwise, it all comes down. Your ad entire identity, just like Gil Martin says, comes down to the job. And I'm curious, Mike, if you've ever felt any of that or what are the things, maybe the first question is, what are the things you do outside the job to kind of keep yourself grounded? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I agree with everything you said about having an outlet and dealing with the stuff. I think there's been a big push lately that about wellness and, and police officer wellness, and that's a good thing. I mean, people are starting to see the, the toll that this job takes. Um, I, I got to interact a bunch with a, a doctor from San Diego that's doing, uh, he's a psychologist that's doing a lot of work in this in this field, Dr. Daniel Bloomberg. And he, he talks a lot about police officer wellness and how those things translate into 
our decision making as it as they as it pertains to uh, morals and ethics and those sorts of things and it it's a it's really fascinating work to see how that all fits into the big picture but as far as you know for me i i did a lot of rock climbing when i was younger and there was a point in my career where i got back into that because it was one of those things where uh you know, I just needed, I needed a happy place and somewhere to go. And I, I got back into it. it. It's kind of fallen back into the background again. I need to, hopefully, I also, I'm a new dad. So I've got a, a 16 month old and when he's old enough to go climbing, then I hope to get back into that too. But, um, there was a point in my career where, you know, I, I decided I needed to, to do something and I got back into climbing and that was a, a good outlet for me to just kind of go and problem solve and focus on something other than, work all the time because what I found was that everything, all of my hobbies were things that all related to work. When I went to the gym and I worked out, it was what do I need to be focusing on to enhance my performance on the job? And if I wanted to do jujitsu, it was like, well, I'm doing jujitsu because I might have to use these skills on the job. Uh, I like shooting, but when I go shoot, it's all about having to shoot so that I could perform well on the job. You know, they all kind of circled to that thing. And yep it's important to kind of look, look outside of that a little bit, whatever that is. So yeah, mountain biking is, is, um, one that I used to do when I was younger. I, I wasn't real hardcore into it, but, um, I've tried to kind of rekindle that fire a little bit. Um, climbing, like, like I said, I mean, even just, just being more active and getting outdoors in general, I think is, is probably good for anybody. But, um, I think the the key is to do something <laughs> that, that's not related to work and get outside of work. And maybe more importantly is to, is to have people around you to enjoy it with um, that you can disconnect from a little bit. So whether that's, you know, you're a spouse or a close friend or a buddy from another, you know, it doesn't have to be a completely different field, but from the military or from a different agency or from, you know, a, another sector in public safety or something like that, but have, have people around you to enjoy it with and, and just kind of see outside of your little bubble. Don't get stuck in that rut, I guess. Oh yeah. That's, it's so easy for us, you know, to only hang out with other cops and, uh, that's dangerous, right? That's, I mean, it sounds great because they're the, I mean, it's easy. It's that's what it is really. It's just, they're, it's easy. You're on the same shifts. You, you understand that you can't make the Sunday afternoon barbecue. So you guys have, we have them on a Wednesday, <laughs> but, but while everyone else works, but that slowly turns into kind of this insidious, uh, echo chamber where you yes. only interact with people who have the same experience and the same, oftentimes the same beliefs and attitude. And if you're, if it's, it's a, it's, we, we, it's very easy to, um, unexpectedly or unintentionally start dragging each other down i think um just with the yeah. stuff that you talk about the stuff you interact with i mean i have a buddy who i haven't i haven't seen in a while but like when we get together um he's a cop in a different agency uh and our, our wives enjoy each other's company right and so like conceivably we could go out and like talk about normal human things but that never happens right <laughs> we, we go out and the two of us uh <laughs> start start sharing stories and oh you wouldn't believe this and that and blah 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 and those talk uh, our poor wives, yeah, talk, we talk shop, and our poor wives just you know sit there and like, are you done? Like, can we talk about something else now? Um, and so, <laughs> I and I found that to be true too. Like you know, Gross Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, who I know you're familiar with, you did a great episode on on his books. He, he's one of those people that advocates that your hobbies should reinforce your training and and reinforce what you do at work, and I absolutely disagree with that. You know, like like you just said, your hobbies need to be something completely different than the job, something that you can totally check out from. And yes, it's important to train and it's important to get strong and it's important to be able to shoot tactically and all that. But like you just said, if you're doing all those things with that mindset that it revolves back to work, then you're you're not doing anything different. You're just stuck in that echo chamber of your own mind, which is even worse. Yeah. See, this is an episode of Tangents. I think it's yeah. absolutely appropriate that your show is called Tactical Tangents, and you've <laughs> set me off on like three already. So, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> well, it's the I, coffee. Like, like I said, my <laughs> my my friends uh, my friends will tell you I'm good at that, if nothing else. That you know, uh, the other thing about it is, and this kind of like reciprocates and, and magnifies itself. But you know, if you go to a 
a party or a gathering or something and there's a bunch of non-cops there, you always find yourself, people will ask you questions or you find yourself talking about cop stuff, you know, and you're like, ah, I'm trying to get away from that and here we are, I'm kind of doing the same thing. But I, I think part of this is, one, the hobbies and the, and the, I guess, outside, you know, whatever outlets you have, whatever they're going to be, you know, mountain biking, rock climbing, ballet, I guess, whatever it is, um, there can still be things that you take from those places and apply to your profession. Because, you know, most of us are pretty passionate people. We care a lot about our work and we try to apply ourselves as, you know, full commitment as we can. But the other side of it is, is it just keeps us grounded in, you know, what it means to be a, a normal person, I guess. And that's important because if you forget what, what life and, and the world is like around you, then, you know, you're, you're so consumed by just this job that it's like, you know, who is it that you're, that you're serving? I think it's important to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of, of our culture and our society. You know, it's a big part of your identity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who's been a cop for any length of time has been to that party where everyone's like, or or the, the party host or someone who's like, Hey everybody, he's a cop, you know? And then, <laughs> like, yep. it's, it's, it's one of those weird jobs where, uh, you know, you, I've never been to a party where, where someone's come in the door and the host has been like, Hey everybody, he's an accountant, you know, or he's a, de this guy's a dentist. <laughs> never happened, but I couldn't tell you how many times I've been to a party and, and it get, you know, I, I'm dimed out within minutes and uh, people yeah. are asking questions or want to know the stories or, you know, that sort of stuff. So it was just one of those things. I'm eager to introduce to someone do. that way now. <laughs> you totally should. You know, next time someone dimes you out, you should uh, throw it right back at them because uh, it's just funny, you know, because there's so much curiosity around us and the job as there should be. And I think, uh, you know, for people that admire us, there's a lot they want to learn. For people who don't know much about us, there's a lot of mystery they want to uncover. Um, and it's just this weird moment, I think, for people when they see someone out of uniform in a relaxed environment, that they don't connect the fact that you're a human being as well sometimes. You know? um, yeah. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit because I want to talk about your work. And, you know... You touched on the fact that you were hired in 2008 during the hiring freeze. And I remember for us, when the hiring freeze came about, I was a relative, I was new. I was like two years in, uh, a little, maybe a little over that, but about two years in. And uh, like we cut spots. There was no movement into any specialty assignment. Um, like, you know, everybody who had a spot basically got locked down. And so there was, there was no opportunity for personal growth for a good like four or five years you were just not getting into like a detective spot unless somebody retired out of it. And uh, so I'm curious with that dynamic of moving into law enforcement right at the beginning of a hiring freeze, your agency lost, I think you said like 300 officers around that time, but you got these positions, you got, you know, patrol, then FTO, which is awesome. That's such a huge job in any agency, then canine and then SWAT. What is it that has made you successful at work? They, a lot has to do with just your attitude. I mean, people, I, it, it sounds cheesy when you, when you get around these kinds of conversations and you talk about leadership, cause it's such a, I, I think it's a concept that people, I don't know, maybe it's just kind of nebulous to them. I mean, people are, it's real quick to have feelings about your, your bosses or your management, or, you know, if you work for a, a, a government you know, bureaucracy or whatever to, to talk like leadership kind of becomes one of those just catchphrases, you know? And, and I think if you have an attitude where you're committed to, to just your own growth and, and to being a leader within the, the, you know, arms reach of the things that you can affect or have some influence over, then that's a big part of it. I mean, when I became an FTO, and I'd get a new rookie. I, every conversation I would have with them in the in the very beginning was something to the effect of, "Look, I I became a, a field training officer because I have high expectations not only for myself but for the people around me. And in a lot of ways, I'm not happy with what I see, and I think we could do better. 
And so I'm, I'm an FTO and I'm your FTO now because I want to make you better than, than me and some of these other people out here that need to step up their game. And, you know, that, I mean, that carried me to try to improve my game when I was, you know, a young, young rookie cop. And it was part of that kind of sphere of influence that I could have a, an impact with early on, you know, and I think that just stuck with me as I, as I got into these other assignments and I started teaching not just one-on-one -on -one stuff, but at the academy level or, you know, to, to other canine handlers or SWAT guys or, you know, whatever it is, wherever I'm at in, in my career and my life. Um, just trying to have that attitude about, you know, pushing the status quo and trying to make us all collectively better. It wasn't about, at least I try not to make it about me. I mean, people will tell you that I'm cocky or whatever, and I, it's not on purpose. I just have crappy people skills, but, but I think that's, that's a big part of it is just, it's just about having a, a good attitude about it. And instead of like blaming and pointing fingers, you just take ownership and personal responsibility over the things that you do have control over. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that's helped me. In ancient Rome, soldiers would step into battle to fight for the empire, but they also had bills to pay and family back home to support. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, if soldiers performed well in battle, they would be paid in gold coins. If they performed with exceptional valor, they would be given an extra coin. Legend has it that this coin was often minted with the name and symbol of the legion in which they served, and that soldiers would hold on to these coins as proof of their bravery. This made their coins a prized possession. Throughout history, unique coins have been part of nearly every warrior tradition. There's a story from World War I in which an American pilot was held captive as a German POW and stripped of all of his personal identification. He escaped the POW camp but was detained by the French who thought he was a German spy. He carried with him a coin with a symbol that one of the French soldiers recognized as that of an American squadron. The coin saved his life. Challenge coins remain an important part of this warrior tradition, including those in law enforcement and the other first responder professions. Signature coins out of Orlando, Florida is my choice for challenge coins for the squad room. Their staff of artists can create and make most any design a reality, and their quality is top-notch. The people at Signature Coins are complete professionals like you, and they take their jobs seriously. Quality is their priority, and I can tell you that it shows in the Squadroom Coins that I ordered from them. You can check out their handiwork on my Instagram, at The Squadroom. For more information or to get a free quote with no artwork fee, check out their website at SignatureCoins.com. If you use the coupon code The Squadroom, you can get $50 off your first order. That's SignatureCoins.com. Now, back to the show. You know, I think um, that you just you just hit on two key points that I mean, I preach about constantly about control what you can control, and understanding what you the difference between understand the difference between what you can control and what you can't, and focus on what you can. But you just touched on something else I haven't really talked a lot about, but I recently did a, a Instagram post about it, and then and that got some attention. So I did an interview on another sh podcast about uh, these call them six tips to improve your leadership right now. And one of those is exactly what you just said, which is uh, you called it sphere of influence. I call it span of influence, same thing, but understanding uh, what you can affect and how far you can reach. And don't assume that it's, that it's just what's obviously in front of you. You know, as an F, a good example is as an FTO, right? You, you have that person in the car with you and you're obviously, no one is going to question that, you have influence and ability to uh, improve or degrade the person that's in the car with you, right? But as an FTO, you also have influence all over all the other trainees uh, and, and over the FTO program. And um, you may not control the program, but you have influence over how it's, how it's presented, how it's created, how it's organized. Um, you have the ear of the FTO coordinator, at least to some degree. And one of the biggest lessons I try to impart to people is to understand your sphere of influence or your span of influence and understand that it's not is it's much larger than you think it is. You know, for line level guys and, and girls who are just starting, you still have a span of influence and it's your it's your teammates on your on your shift. Right. And you have the ability to influence them with positive uh, work product, with knowledge, with skills, with abilities and 
we often assume we don't have anything to give other people, and I think that's that's inaccurate, you know. Um, so I, I touch that span of influence uh, is is a big deal. It's, it took me a while to figure that one out. There's something you said there too that I think gets neglected, and and part of it, like you mentioned, the FTO coordinator thing, and it, it's also the your ability to lead up, and I think yes. that that people forget that, you know, just because you're not the decision maker, that that doesn't mean you can't put yourself out there and, and take your ideas somewhere and, and say, hey, boss, you know, I, I want I was thinking about this. What do you think about, you know, how could I make this idea better or, you know, and, and you'd be surprised because it, and it's a lot of times it's not because like everyone likes to say like, oh, crappy leadership and crappy management. They always again, they like to point fingers. Right. And and they forget that, you know, hey, they're getting pressures from other other angles and they've got other tasks and things that maybe you're not seeing and you haven't had to deal with yet. And if, if you go to them with an idea, it's kind of a breath of fresh air and they might have that ability to say, Hey, you know what, if you want to take this and run with it, I will empower you to do those things. And yeah, I mean, not, not all bosses are created equal. Right. And, and so there's something to be said about, you know, an organization improving the quality of its leadership, but to that same point, you know, you can still speak up, you could still be part of the solution. And, and even if that means being the one guy out of the group of people that wants to, you know, bitch and complain all the time, sorry about my language, but, um, you know, you can be the voice that goes and says, Hey, boss, this is what I think we could do a little bit better. What do you think about this? And that's a, I mean, that's a, that's part of that span of, of influence, like you're talking about. And I think that gets overlooked. Yeah, I talk about that specifically as as lighten your leader's load, you know, and that's how you start to lead up is is bring in bring bring your boss, whoever your boss is, whether it's your corporal or your sergeant or your lieutenant or captain or whatever. They've got a plate full of problems that you don't know about and things that they need to accomplish. And I, I learned early that if you brought a problem to a boss. And then as I, and I, this was doubly learned once I became a boss, quote unquote, um, if you bring me a problem, you're bringing me a headache. <laughs> you're bringing me something else that I need to do, or yep. you're bringing me something else that now it takes my bandwidth away from the things that I already need to work on. And, but I understand that things come up, there are problems, there are issues, you know, stuff happens. But if you can bring me a solution to that problem, and it's thorough and well thought out, and it may not be completely appropriate or online, but if you bring me a solution that we can start to work from, you will start to build trust uh, with your boss. And if you do that over and over again, you're eventually going to be given um, given full trust, or at least as much trust as they can possibly give you based on the relationship. And you will start to really affect some change in the things you want to see happen. Uh, have, you found, have you found that to be the case? <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, you'll definitely get that, but you'll also uh, you'll talk yourself into a lot more work too, which isn't always a bad thing to be clear, but it, you know, it's, you go to your boss with, your, with this great solution, great idea, and suddenly it's like, well, thanks for volunteering. You're on it. <laughs> but that's a good thing, right? That's, that's kind of how you move up in the world and, and gain that experience and affect positive change. So yeah, I, I mean, I agree that that is definitely part of the solution. Um, it, it's also why it's also why I, I stay very busy all the time, but uh, it's worth it. <laughs> but it's but it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, you're going to get more work. But if you're really interested in leading, or you're really interested in making things better and not just complaining about it, you need to expect that you're going to have to do some work. You, like yeah, you just said absolutely. earlier, you, you can't point fingers at your boss and demand that things change, but then break out the beach chair and just <laughs> wait for things to happen. It's yeah. not, it's not going to work. And that's not, that's true in, in any organization. Right. And so it's really incumbent on the people who do want to see change, who, who authentically want to see change, not the people who just want to complain about the way things are, but if you want to see real change, you need to start building trust with the people above you. And that's leading up, you know, uh, you're obviously not telling your boss what to do, but you're gaining that trust. And that's a, that's a key component of leadership. 
And then you can start to really uh, be involved. And eventually you're going to find yourself invited into the conversations about the real, the real issues. Yeah. And I, and I joke about the, you know, creating more work for yourself, but I think that's part of the thing that young junior leaders need to understand and recognize and, and appreciate is that, you know, these, these ideas and these, this progress and these changes and this, whatever it is that you're after, right? Like that doesn't get created in a vacuum. It takes work. And it takes, it takes time to take, you know, and, and another thing is creative space. Like people don't realize that like, if you're trying to problem solve and you're like, this is my budget issue, this is my staffing issue, this is my training situation, you know, you need like the creative space to sit down and go, okay, what are some options that I can come up with to try to remedy this problem? And where else can I look for these things? And that does not happen, you know, that does take work. And so you know, it's important work and it, and it is valuable, but I think that's part of what a lot of people don't see when they throw those, those gripes and those complaints and point all the fingers and stuff is that, you know, it, you have to apply yourself and that, and that's not as easy as it sounds sometimes. You know, one of the things that comes with leadership are lessons. You know, you, you, you reflect back on things you've done, uh, good or bad, and you change, and then you're able to see the path forward a little bit better than the people who are coming behind you, you know, and, and able, able to adapt or adopt the lessons you've learned in the past. I'm curious if you're willing to share a moment in your career where you got in your own way or that you unintentionally caused yourself <laughs> to get off course and what you learned from it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got lots of lessons. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and and I, I tend to get in my way more often than not is <laughs> the thing about me. Um, you know, if I trying to find particular ones, I, there, there was a point in my, in my career where, um, there just happened to be a whole lot going on around me as far as, uh, I, I had, a my, my first police dog was kind of a jerk and, and liked to make a chew toy out of my arm and my hands and stuff. Um, and so I, I was dealing with just the, the cumulative stress of dealing with this dog for, for a while. And I ended up on like this um, restricted work situation where I, I was, was kind of like, like out here, we call it light duty. I don't know if everyone has the same, same sort of terminology, but basically like you're not supposed to be fully deployable doing your regular duties. And there was a training event that was coming up that I still wanted to do. It was an opportunity that uh, didn't come around for a long time. And some of the bosses were like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. But, you know, in my head, I kind of did these gymnastics where I, I worked my way around like, well, I mean, they didn't actually say no. When what I should have heard is like, no, dummy, they, they said no and don't go do it. And so I did it anyway. Um, and this was when I was on SWAT and still fairly new. So that that actually got me suspended from the team for the better part of a year. Um, and you know, there was a lot of things that, that kind of came to a head at that point. And some of it was just understanding how I deal with risk and being comfortable with risk in a lot of ways that maybe other people aren't. Um, some of it had to do with, um, you know, recognizing what, you know, cumulative stress can do when you, when you get, start getting distracted and you start getting kind of. I don't want to say careless, but, but just, um, not as comprehensive in your approach to, to dealing with certain things, I guess. Um, but, but anyway, so, so that was, I mean, the one that stands out the most as far as like getting in my own way, which, which is just, I guess the lesson there is, you know, understand some of the things about your personality that, um, that will get you, you know? And for, for example, we've talked about, uh, I like to talk a lot <laughs> and there's been no shortage of times that, um, I've run my mouth and said things that I shouldn't, I, I tend to overshare. I tend to be maybe a little too honest sometimes, and I'll say things to, to people that I probably shouldn't. Um, and, uh, so there was another example of, of a time where, um, so in, in my agency, we have several patrol divisions. We have, we're down to four patrol divisions now. And so when I work in K9, I go all over the city. And so I, I kind of scan all the channels and listen to business 
as it goes on, looking for the opportunity to go use my dog somewhere, right? And so uh, there, there was a time where uh, someone was running from the police and um, I kind of just caught a fragment of it because I was scanning channels and I, this actually wasn't very long ago, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I caught this little fragment of someone talking about, you know, this guy running from the police and he was kind of just, in my, in my view, wasn't taking it very seriously. And I was like, Hey man, like if only we had a group of people that went and looked for people who run from the police, like that's kind of my thing. And so I went over to that channel. I was like, are we going to look for this guy? Or are we just going to let him get away? Like I, I said something just kind of snippy like that on the radio. Well, I didn't realize that it was a, it was a supervisor that was talking, um, <laughs> and it was running that show. And so, um, blurted that out and, and immediately realized that I, I drove over there. I publicly apologized to him in person. I sent a message out over the computer saying, yeah, that was inappropriate and this and that. And, and you know, the, the point I'm making with both of those stories is there's a couple things that I have learned the hard way about my own personality, right? I'm, I'm a very passionate person. I lack a filter sometimes. And so when I, when I think it's important to go catch bad guys and, and something interferes with that, then I'm, I'm at risk to say something that I shouldn't. And those are the times that I need to kind of clamp down on, <laughs> on the, on my mouth. <laughs> um, and again, going back to the, to the situation where I was on light duty and I went and did something I shouldn't have done. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with risk than with, with certain risks than other people might be. And so I have to make sure that I don't get ahead of myself of, of who's in charge and what, their directions and their orders are and stuff like that. And so um, we all have those things. We all have those quirks about our personality, whatever they might be. And so your job is to, to figure out and recognize what they are and then to take that insight and turn that into behavior, right? And to, to learn A, when to do a double take on a decision that you're going to make that might be a little bit more risky for some people or B, when you should be especially careful of what you're going to say next and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, th those are a couple, I guess, more nuanced big picture lessons that I think are, are worth sharing. So you touch on one of the, like, <laughs> Hey, it sounds like I could have given the same answer about oversharing and opening my mouth and being a little too passionate and honest at times. It has certainly come to, uh, uh, come home to roost uh, at times in the past for me too. Um, but self-awareness is such a big component of, of development of anything, whether you're just trying to make yourself better or you're trying to be a leader. How, what are the things you've done yourself to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are and what, uh, and to be aware of the fact that you, you know, might, say something in an inopportune time, what are the things you've used to get to that point? Cause it's not something you're born with. Uh, and it's not, it's a skill. It's a skill that you have to learn. What have you done? No, it, it's definitely not something you're born with. And I, and like I said, I mean, one of those examples, it wasn't really that long ago. I mean, <laughs> I, I still relearn some of these lessons from time to time, but, well, that's um, true. You, you know, again, that, I, I go back to the the attitude and the growth mindset thing. You know, there's a lot of research. If you talk about like uh, learning theories, how people view their own ability to learn. And some people think that it's just a fixed quantity. And some people have a growth mindset that they can get incrementally better at things. And that I think that has, that plays into it quite a bit. And that's a product of, you know, even when you were, how you were raised when you were a kid, how your teachers and coaches and parents interacted with you, but also, it's something that you can have your own effect over if you put your mind to it and you think about those things. So I would encourage people to, to look at and understand that concept. Um, but as far as like the specifics, I mean, one of the most helpful things that someone ever said to me was, you know, it's, it's not that Mike is a jerk. It's that he's all business. And it, and it made me realize that like, well, that's one way of spinning it, you know, and it's not that he was trying to change the narrative of, you know, cause, cause I, I was used to people just telling me that I came across poorly or that I, that I would deliver things wrong or that I, you know, sometimes I come across like an asshole, but I mean well and stuff. And again, I apologize about my language, but, um, 
a lot of people have said those sorts of things to me and it's easy to have like that, like, okay, well, whatever, they just don't understand me and they can, you can have a bad attitude about that. But then when, when one of my mentors early on said that to me, it, it's not that he's a jerk. He's just, he's all business. He's really just focused on that task. I go, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And it, it was a little bit more helpful for me to wrap my head around to like make an effort to be more friendly and approachable and not so consumed by the task. Because what what I learned was it's not about being, it's it's not about whether you're right or wrong. It's about how people, how you make people feel, right? So that that was a big part of it. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was a period of time where I was, you know, seeing a, a counselor for a bunch of time and it, it was around that, um, you know, stressful time where I got booted off the team for a little bit and my, my first dog had to get put down and, and that was a, just a difficult and challenging time for me because it was like a chink in my armor when it came to like the identity. And, you know, earlier when we started, we talked about like a successful career and it's like, well, it's not to say that it didn't come without its bump and bumps and bruises along the way, you know. Um, but uh, I, I think a big part of it is just that desire to want to be better and change. I mean, I've had a lot of conversations with people, you know, that that comment that I got about being all business came because I went and I asked people for feedback and I and I and I took their what they said to heart, whether I liked it or not, you know. Or if people were talking about me behind my back and I caught wind of it, rather than just, you know, getting defensive about it and backlashing, I'd try to pull them aside on a one-on-one -on -one level and say, hey, man, like, you're not wrong. You know, I'm just trying to understand what I could do better to be a better person. And so a lot of it is just outlook, you know, I guess. And believe me, I, I, I'm not saying I have it all figured out, but I think that goes a long way. Yeah, I mean, that takes a lot of internal strength or guts to go out and ask for feedback, but it's one of the best things you can do to learn what people think about you. And yes, there's an element of, you know, uh, you know, I don't care what other people think. Well, you don't want to be, you don't want to be swayed by them necessarily, but you want to understand how you're presenting yourself. And you'll learn that only by asking people uh, for feedback and you might not like it and it might hurt or it's probably going to hurt. Um, but you know, you don't have to change who you are. You just can oftentimes change how you present things. And that's, that makes all the difference, you know? And one thing you touched on right there that I want to, man, I had to relearn this recently was that, you know, career progression is not a straight line on a graph from zero to a hundred, <laughs> nope. you know, uh, at a, at a 45 degree angle, you know, it's, it's not linear. <laughs> uh, there are ups and downs, there are setbacks, uh, there's things that launch you forward. But uh, just like losing weight, it's like you don't lose a pound a day for 365 days straight and all of a sudden you're 100 pounds less or whatever. It's up and down and there's changes and there's there's outside factors that you can't control that affect your career success. Um, and I appreciate you sharing about that, that tough moment, you know, when you're going through the cumulative stress. And I think cumulative stress is often overlooked as an issue for us. But you took it upon yourself to go out and, you know, solve, not maybe not solve that problem, but start addressing it anyway. But I'm wondering now at this point, you know, we've talked about some setbacks, but what are, I'm curious, can you give me like, what are the three best decisions you've made in your career? Three best, huh? I mean, the decision to go the, the route that I did in, um, well, you know, this will, uh, let me start, let me start with another one. Um, Cause this relates to a couple of the things that we've talked about. Um, I had a, a bumpy relationship with one of our uh, team leaders at, at one point on SWAT. And it, and it had a lot to do with uh, the, some of those other things I told you about earlier. And he ended up involved in a lot of the training at the agency and, uh, this came at a time where, you know, post Ferguson, there was a lot of changes getting made at our at our department about, you know, use of force training and scenario based training and the way things were getting approached. And, you know, I kind of I put myself out there and, and tried to make amends with this guy. And I tried to um, learn from him what I can do better. Well, and at least express to him that, you know, that that I'm trying to grow and I'm trying to learn and, and 
you know, get on the, get on track, right? And at the same time, addressed with him the things that I felt the agency was getting wrong with training and my ideas to go to go forward. And there were some difficult conversations that followed with that. Um, but at least for the time that he was there, I feel like it it drastically helped change the direction. I don't want to say it changed by itself because obviously it took a village to pull off the the change of direction that our training at our agency saw. Um, but man, am I glad I did that. I mean, for one thing, there was, there was a period of time where uh, he, we were doing this training stuff and he, he pulls me aside one day and he goes, Hey man, you know, I, I, I was kind of a, kind of a jerk to you like back in the day, like you, you didn't deserve that. You're a good cop. And I just didn't recognize that. And I'm sorry. And that, and that was kind of cool. You know, I mean, it was obviously cool on his part to, to have said that, but reassuring to me that it, that, I, that it wasn't all just me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe more importantly is that like that, that was something that I think a lot of people, um, are reluctant to do is to, is to go put yourself out there like that. And one of the scenarios that we did, um, uh, basically got played out in real life. <laughs> and, uh, this, this officer got in a shooting where he was getting shot at and he was like, man, that was the flagpole scenario. That, that was a scenario that those guys put on however long. And my name wasn't necessarily tied to that, but I definitely know that I was a part in making those happen. And, you know, he credited that with, with a successful outcome for him. And so that, that paid off in a lot of ways. I think, I think going forward and having that difficult conversation with that guy and, and taking the ego out of it and just going and, and having a, having a man to man with them, you know, it, it went a long way, man. And it, and that, that, carried me through a lot of things in my career that I think were valuable professionally, just lessons for me to learn. So that's, that's a big one. Um, you know, uh, gosh, a couple other lessons. I mean, there, there's a lot of, or, or, or three decision points that we're, that we're talking about. There's been so many, there's been so many decisions, I guess. Well, obviously I mean, like, like we canine. We talk about something. Yeah. I mean, one example would be like, you know, take putting in for canine and, and, and putting yourself out there yeah. to test for that. Yeah. So let me, uh, I'll, I'll back up a little and just say like, yeah. So what, what other decisions? I mean, so, so that, that one was a big one because I think it has implications for the other stuff that we've talked about, but, um, the decision to get into, to canine and SWAT, I mean, those assignments are the, they, they made me a better person in, in a, in a number of ways. I mean, the, the canine thing is when I got into canine, I, so early in my career, I went on this, the search for a guy that, um, did a, like a home invasion robbery. They, he bailed out on a pursuit. We went searching for him and the, and the canine handler, he's a guy that's still in our unit. He's one of our trainers today. And, uh, I was this brand new cop and we're walking around this neighborhood. We we're checking out a, a church like parking lot and there's this little gated off area and, and he looks over and he's like, he's in there. And I'm like, what? And he's like, he's in there. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're like. How do you know that? <laughs> you know? And, and so he's like, Hey man, you better come out. You're going to get bit by the dog. And he's like, okay, I give up. I'm coming out. And he, and so like from that po moment forward, I'm like, I am going to that. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to go be a dog handler. And, and so I did. And that was the best decision, um, career wise for me because, it held me accountable to like, that was a, it was a challenging assignment to get into. Um, you couldn't, it wasn't for the the faint of heart. If you wanted to be competitive and actually make it, you had to step up your game in a number of ways. And so I think that decision carried some um, resonating effects, not to mention the gratifying work that I've gotten to do as a dog handler, which is really cool. Um, other decisions career wise. Trying to think of, uh, I'm trying to give you a, a good. Um, well, you know, I think one of the answers here. Well, one of the things you touched on maybe is that third one is, um, is going out and seeking feedback. You know, I think I consider that a career decision. You know, like you're realizing that you have a perception or there's a perception about you that's out there, uh, it, true or not, and you went out and made an active attempt to uh, learn more about it, to evaluate your own. Uh, activity, your own behavior, and, and then consider, is it true or not? And if it was true, it sounds like you adopted and 
uh, new techniques to you know bridge the gap and and improve your relationships with those people. I think that's a great one. Yeah, and I mean that's kind of just a that's a life thing too. I guess you know it's it affects everything. I mean decision making is uh we we make lots of different types of decisions you know there's like the rational ones and then there's the emotional ones um but i think you know just there there's a key part of this line of work that requires us to constantly better ourselves and i i think that if you don't have if you're not that kind of person it's really hard to thrive in the kind of work that we do you know mm -hmm. um it's not clinical. It's not something where, you know, like a, like a doctor makes decisions. He's got, he's got labs and test results and all these things that he can kind of look at. And it's maybe not mathematical in that truest sense. He's still got to use some insights and some, some gut, but, but, but you can go back and you can kind of retrace the steps of where he went wrong and, and stuff. And this line of work isn't like that. It's a lot more, I think, um, visceral. A, a lot of times, you know, how are you going to deescalate with someone is not something that I can write for you on a, as, as like a math problem. Deescalating carries a number of forms, right? And so like, you have to embrace that kind of, that kind of thing. And I think if you're not open to feedback, then that goes a long way. Yeah, I think that's a great, great point. You know, we've been on a couple tangents today. Uh, so appropriate time, Mike, to talk about your podcast, Tactical Tangents. Tell everybody about it. So I um, started Tactical Tangents as a as kind of a mentoring thing. You know, I, I mentioned that I like to teach and that I was trying to get into teaching earlier on because I, I'm, I'm still a book nerd. I read a lot. I'm kind of a dweeb. It's just my nature. But <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of things that we don't have time to cover in the police academy that we should. And it blows my mind that you can talk to most cops these days and, and ask them about you know, Waco or Ruby Ridge, and they'll look at you sideways. They don't know anything about what happened at those events. And those are just two examples that coming into the police academy that I had already read about just by chance, you know. Um, and, and so my effort to sort of bridge that gap and to give new people who, and, and they don't have to be new, but I, I kind of tailored it initially to, to new guys, but people that wanted to, to learn more but didn't necessarily have the time and the energy to do it on their own, they can have this medium where we could create content for them to consume and, and be able to, to learn something new and to talk about some of the nuance. You know, a lot of it is not something that you just go read in a book. It's more, you know, maybe this discussion could be valuable or maybe we can kind of bounce back and forth between different outcomes in a scenario and, and talk about the difficulty and the decisions that get made. One of my favorite examples is when we talk about police shootings and people are like, it's justified. It's not justified. And I think any cop can tell you that's been on for a while, like, well, it's justified, but it, I don't really like it, you know? And why can't, right. why can't it just be like that? And so um, that's kind of how it started was a little bit of a mentoring project. It also was a, a positive outlet for me to take some of the things that I had negative attitudes about that I felt needed to change and say like, hey, look, if, if my ideas aren't gonna do well and it, uh, with some people, then they'll do better with others. <laughs> and so uh, I started putting it out there for the world to see and not just for my department to see, you know? So mm -hmm. we started this podcast and it's called Tactical Tangents. We um, talk about not just law enforcement related things. My partner and co-host is a military pilot. He uh, flies airplanes. And so we, we try to draw a lot of parallels for the military and other public safety crowds, as well as anyone into the survival and self-defense type of thing. What I, yeah. And I like, I like that you have a co-host, uh, in, uh, in the military because it's, you know, obviously we have so many things that overlap and people don't realize when they talk about the militarization of police, they assume that it's all bad. And I, I actually think it's quite the opposite. I assume it's all good. And I'm not talking about like, rolling tanks into town, but the tactics and strategies, the military and leadership, the, the military is really light years ahead of us in a lot of those things. And we adopt those things because we see that it works in the military and having a co-host with that perspective, the two of you really deconstruct a lot of these things with, uh, with similar, but different, um, uh, backgrounds and mindsets about it. And it's really interesting. So I, I enjoy the show. Uh, it can be found wherever you get your podcasts, um, and also the website is uh, tactical, tactical tangents.com, right? Yep, that's it. 
Well, Mike, I appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, I think, you know, not, this sounds self-serving when I say, you know, putting yourself out there with a podcast makes you a leader, blah, blah, blah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, here I am saying that on my podcast. But, you know, the more officers, deputies, correctional officers, whoever, that go out there and whether it's a podcast or whether they teach at the academy or whether they're in FTO or any of those things where we can take an opportunity to share ideas and lead, um, it's needed. You know, the, the profession would stall and, 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 and be, be uh, delegitimized uh, without those people and those ideas pushing us forward and, and, and making progress. So thank you for what you do for the profession and, and for putting on such a quality show and, and being a part of the of the community of people who want to see this, you know, this profession that we love get better, and uh, and uh, and we do that by starting conversations. So thanks for being part of this conversation today. For everyone who's listening, if you want to find out more about Tactical Tangents and Mike's podcast, it's in the show notes for this episode. Just go to thesquadroom.net and you'll see everything in the show there. And uh, Mike, I look forward to continuing the conversation another time. Thanks, I appreciate it. And thanks again to your listeners as well. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode with Mike Doyle. Uh, Really thinking back about our conversation with Mike, and I relate that to badges. And if you're new to the show, you probably haven't heard me talk about it a little bit, but badges is an acronym I use to basically frame any question or any issue I'm dealing with in my life to frame my own mindset. And it stands for beliefs, actions, discipline, goals, emotions, and service. And so I think about what Mike said about beliefs in himself and in his own uh, actions at work, the actions of going out and seeking input from people and seeking uh, guidance from people and, and, and not being uh, set up or, or, or stayed in the belief that he was right. He, uh, he was able to question his own beliefs and go out and uh, use his actions to better himself. Uh, clearly a disciplined guy that got into a very competitive unit uh, at, at his department. And he did that by setting goals. He saw what he wanted to do, and he moved towards that. Uh, and also talked, frankly, about his emotions and how he had to keep those in check and how at one time in his career uh, they became, uh, in his words, cumulative cumulative stressors and how he uh, was bold enough uh, to go out and seek treatment and uh, or, or counseling. And uh, I think it's fantastic that he's willing to talk about those things and and also pursue his own health in that way. And of course, his service is obvious, his service to his own agency and his service to his community and his service to other officers around the world through his own podcast. So I think to me that Mike encompasses the idea of badges very clearly. All right, if you want to know how you can support the show, there's a few ways to do that. If you like what you heard today, if you got something out of this conversation, please consider leaving a review on the podcast player of your choice. Please also leave a comment with your review if you can. Second, share this episode with any or any other episodes with someone you love or the people that you know need to hear about this. You can share episodes right from our webpage at thesquadroom.net and from most podcast players. Also, there's some great companies out there who support the podcast and support you as well. Go to thesquadroom.net forward slash support to see exclusive deals from Signature Coins, Hard to Kill Fitness, On It, Ranger Up, Hardhead Veterans, Audible, OfficerPrivacy.com, ComGearSupply.com. Lots of great companies. And join our Facebook group and, of course, follow me on Instagram. A special thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, Signature Coins. If you're looking for a challenge coin for your agency or specialty unit, check them out at SignatureCoins.com and use the coupon code THESQUADROOM, all one word, the Squad Room for $50 off your order. If you're shopping at Ranger Up, uh, use the code THESQUADROOM to get 10% off your order. And if you're looking for the best fitting ballistic helmet that exceeds NIJ standards but won't break the bank, check out Hardhead Veterans and use coupon code SQUADROOM to get $20 off your helmet. Now again, make sure you sign up for that mailing list at thesquadroom.net to get exclusive access to content that I only deliver to the mailing list. You can do that right there at our website, thesquadroom.net. And until next time, take care of each other and stay safe.